Well, hello and welcome to our Bible class for the day. Thanks for joining. Let's start with our, with our prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to study your word. It is an eternal insight that we get into our God and we're grateful. This new study that we're starting today, we pray that you will bless over the next few weeks. When we fail you, forgive us. Again, we're thankful, Father, for all you've done for us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, uh, again, hello, and I appreciate you taking time to join. We're going to be starting the book of uh, 1 John today. Uh, if you've kind of been following along, this is a journey that we've been taking through the New Testament uh, oh, for about the last five years. Uh, and we've done about three quarters of the New Testament up to this point. We probably have at least another couple of years uh, to, to finish it all, uh, but it's been a, it's been a wonderful experience and, and opportunity to uh, to work our way all the way through the New Testament. So, First John, uh, again for those who have been kind of, kind of been following along, we've we've just finished the the Corinthian letters, uh, First and Second Corinthians, and the writing styles of of, of Paul. Uh, contrasted with John are just stark. Uh, Paul was sometimes what would would seemingly be difficult to understand. Uh, he would be he would be straightforward. Uh, John on the other hand, uh, there is so much simplicity in he writes that it's just almost elementary. However, the teaching that he gives is so exponentially Difficult, not difficult, but so exponentially deep uh, that it's just almost amazing. Uh, but it, it's, it's a stark contrast. Both of the writers use styles that we don't utilize today. Uh, most of the styles that we utilize today are very structured. We, uh, you know, when we when we write something, we we have an introduction, then we have certain points, and then we have a conclusion. That's not typically the way that they wrote. Uh, they didn't write with the same grammar rules that we apply today often. Uh, in fact, when we get into uh, the book here in a, in a little bit, the first three verses, which are very long verses, are all one thought uh, with a period at the end of the third verse. Uh, something that in, in our grammar style we just don't do today. So sometimes it makes it challenging for us to understand. John, of course, was an apostle. Uh, John, of course, was one of the... the the inner circle uh, of the Savior. Uh, he wrote five books of the New Testament. Uh, he wrote the Gospel of John, of course, and then 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he also wrote Revelation. Revelation, I guess you would say, would be kind of the outlier. Uh, it, 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 it was, a, it was a, a, a message that was kind of separate. The Gospel and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John almost go together hand in glove. Uh, they, are, they are amazingly similar. Uh, John uses very similar introductions to both the Gospel and 1st John. Of course, the, first, uh, the book of 1st John, or the letter of 1st John, uh, is, is five chapters. The other, 2nd and 3rd John, are just, just one chapter, so much shorter. Uh, but First John, again, the introduction and the introduction to the gospel are just, uh, it's just amazing. And we'll refer back to those as, as we're working through that this morning. I had one uh, uh, commentator that wrote this. He wrote, the gospel of John gives the theology of Christ. In the book of first, in the first epistle of John, gives the ethics of Christian living. And, and, I, and I like that. Uh, the, the, the gospel written very likely very soon after uh, the death of the Savior uh, gave and focused on teachings. Uh, here we are probably now when, when he's writing the second, maybe as many as 30 or 40 years later that he's writing, that he's writing the subsequent, uh, what we would call books of the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And again, they carry some similarities, but there's some differences, and, and it's a different, it's a different approach that he's using, a different audience, certainly, uh, versus trying to convict someone of belief in Christ. This is mostly uh, talking about the, the, the things that we do now as a Christian, uh, so a little bit different audience. When Paul wrote, many of his letters uh, were directed toward a specific church and toward problems, etc. For instance, when he wrote the, the first and second Corinthians, directed to the church in Corinth, uh, certainly applicable to all of, all of uh, Christianity for all time. Same thing with the Galatian letters to the church of Galatia, the letter to the Ephesians to the church at Ephesus, etc. Uh, 
the letter that, that, that John is writing, one of the commentators I read uh, referred to it as a, what they referred to it as a circular letter, uh, a letter that was intended to be for anyone and to be passed around from church to church. Uh, so again, different purposes, different ideas uh, on, on, on how they approached it. Uh, the book of John, First John is going to be divided uh, very rudimentary into really three different areas. In verses, uh, in chapter 1, verse 5, uh, he's going to introduce the idea that God is light. And then he's going to spend about the next, the remainder of chapter 1 and most of chapter, most of chapter 2, uh, or much of chapter 2, uh, talking about this idea and contrasting God with darkness, God with, with you know, God being light and evil, etc. Then when we get into uh, the very end of chapter 2, verse 29, he introduces the idea that God is righteousness. And then he will expound on that for, for two or three chapters. And then the third area which he would give would be beginning in chapter 4, verse uh, 7 and 8, pretty much through the end of the book, God is love. Uh, and again, very crude outline. Uh, most of the books of the New Testament kind of defy a classic outline as we, uh, we would think about it. Again, in our way of thinking and in our way of structuring documents like this, letters like this, uh, we, we, we begin, we have defined points, and then we conclude. And, and that's, that's just our style of writing. 2,000 years ago, that wasn't the style of writing. So sometimes it's, it, it makes it challenging for us to really reach in there and... and, and and again, because of our thinking, we want to define the outline and define the structure. And, and sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. Paul was uh, very difficult to follow because Paul would introduce a thought and then he would go on sometimes to two or three other thoughts and then he would come back to that original thought, sometimes verses later, sometimes chapters later. And it, it makes it very challenging for us to, to, to follow that, th that flow all the way through because our thinking now is is more in a, in a contemporary fashion where, where it's different. So again, it's not right or wrong. It's just something that we have to try to understand and, and grasp as we're trying to study through the New Testament. Uh, so let's begin, uh, let's begin working through. We'll probably work down through uh, verse 4 or 5. Uh, today and then uh, we'll pick up next week uh, as we work through again relatively short book so uh, even if we go slow it's just a six or seven week study so we're gonna we're just gonna work a little bit uh, a little bit down through there so John first John chapter 1 verse 1 what was from the beginning John starts off writing very similar to where he starts it uh, it starts his his uh, his gospel out but the idea of the beginning you know, I had I read some commentators that uh, that felt like the beginning was maybe the, the beginning of the church or the beginning of the Christian era. Others felt like maybe the beginning uh, would go back to the time of Genesis when when God built the earth. The more prevalent thought there uh, was something, the, an idea that Paul used in some of his writings. Paul said this thing: "From times eternal," was the way he would rephrase that. Uh, before the world was. And, and to me, that makes more sense uh, because w we understand that God's plan to redeem us was actually formulated before He before He created us. I started to say invented. I apologize. Before He created us, that's the times of the beginning that He was talking about. In in my interpretation, what was from the beginning, what we and and again, I apologize for having to just stop on specific words. But these are important. The we that he's talking about, again, most theologians and commentators feel like that would be mostly the apostles, uh, and in some cases maybe uh, uh, the other writers of the New Testament if they weren't an apostle. Uh, excuse me, just one second. Having some lighting problems. Uh, some other writers of the New Testament, etc. Mostly, they felt like it's the apostolic group, and and that would make the most sense. Those were the people that were that were with Jesus. Uh, and as he's going through this, I think you're going to get the feel of, of who he's talking about. Uh, it was the it was the ones who were tasked with propagating the gospel for all of time. Uh, you know, it's sometimes difficult for us to think about doing something that's going to be impactful in a day or a week or a month. But think about teaching things that are going to be 
important and life-changing for centuries, uh, millennia, as we say. Uh, it, it was an extraordinary task, and, and that's what they were for, here for. But listen, listen to the way he goes on. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, what we have touched with our hands, that is John trying to emphasize, and he's going to continue this in the next couple of verses. He's going to continue talking about, this is not something that we read about. This is not something that we, that we heard about. This is not rumor. This is not legend. This was a man that we were in his presence daily. We were, we were intimately involved in his life. And, you know, heard him, saw him. Felt him, you know, and, and I, I think back when when he's talking about that, I think back to the time after the cross when when he held out his hands and and invited them to to touch the holes, to touch the the places where the where they were pierced. Uh, that is that is something that John is trying to impress upon the writers. We were the ones that experienced it. This is not something. This is not a story we're telling. We are relating. Our experiences and, and, and that's important for us to appreciate what we have heard what we have seen with our eyes what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life that's an interesting phrase go back if you would uh, to the the gospel of John uh, the gospel of John uh, chapter 1 verse 1 uh, again, in the introduction of John. And, and again, there's great similarities between the Gospel specifically and 1 John. But listen to what John wrote. First John, I'm no, sorry, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When we think of, when we think of, of God... We, 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 we tend to think of God, or we don't tend to, we, we think of God kind of in, in three persons. We think of God as the Father, and then we think of God as, in, in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and then we think of God as the Son, the, the Savior, uh, the Messiah. Three individuals, three, three unique characters. And when we think of Jesus specifically, we, we tend to think almost exclusively of him in his fleshly form, his human form, which was. he. We'll talk a little bit later. God became man, became flesh. Uh, that is difficult for us to, to comprehend as, as fleshly mortal humans, people. Uh, we tend to think of ourselves, although, you know, in Ert in me, you have this, you have this fleshly self, and a part of me is my, my spirit, my soul, the peace that will go on after I die. Uh, this, this body will, will return to the dust. It will return to ash, you know, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. It, 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 will, it will decay over time. But the, but the peace of me will go on. And those are almost inseparable, aren't they? I mean, I just, you just almost can't think about your body as, as outside of the mind or outside of the spirit because we're just, we're just so intertwined. God would appear to be different, and we, we grasp to understand that. And John is the only one that really talks about this in this way, where he described Jesus, the Son, as the Word of God. Uh, and then, of course, the Spirit of God. Each of those are, are one, yet, you, yet three unique individuals and personalities. Uh, as as they as they interact with mankind and as they interact with the Father, I'm not sure that that's something that we can even truthfully comprehend as, as people. We we can study it, we can we can think we understand it, but it's so vastly different from us and and the way that that we were created. Uh, some similarities certainly, but again, my my spirit and my soul, separate from my body, certainly is death, but there would be nothing left of the body. Whereas the Father, His Spirit leaves with a uniquely separate personality, the Holy Spirit, and the Father is still intact. You know, we kind of tend to think of God as the, as the, as the one on the throne, the, the one, the one that, that, is, that is worshipped. Uh, and it, it's, it's challenging for us. And, and John is just giving us some wonderful insight here, but I love the way he does that. He's talking about, in, in verse 1 here, we heard, we saw, we, we looked at, we touched. 
concerning the word of life. And the word, the W in word is capitalized, inferring and teaching us that that is Jesus. And the word we read in, in, the, in the gospel became life, uh, or became alive. And again, it's, it's so interesting to study and try to understand, but I'm not sure we can comprehend it, in, at least in this life. Uh, but it continues on. In verse 2, he says, And the life was manifested. So go back back over to, to the Gospel of John again. Again, it's just it's just striking the, the, the similarities here and, the, and the, the, the duplication of teaching. So we go back over to John, the Gospel. The first chapter, verse 14, and listen to what John wrote back in the Gospel. He said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we saw... His glory. Now, again, for us to grasp that is very likely something that, that is impossible because we just can't understand God. We can't understand the, the, the Trinity, the uniqueness and the similarities and the, the individuality and the person. I mean, it, they're, they're just something that's very difficult for us to grasp. But basically what John's saying, the peace of God, the Son, as we would call it, came and became one of us, became flesh, just like was. And this is what he's talking about in verse 2. And the life was manifested. It became flesh. And the life was manifested. And he continues on with this idea of being eyewitnesses, of being someone that was there. And we have seen and testify and proclaim. Seen, eyewitnesses. Testify, preach, teach, share that. Proclaim. In my mind, is John sharing that through his gospel? I mean, that's that's the idea of how he proclaimed uh, and, and and shared with us uh, the story of Jesus. And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us again, trying to help us grasp the concept of what was heavenly, what was with God for fraternity before and forever and now that was with God and it became flesh and we saw it I mean that's that's the idea that John's trying to give which was with the Father and was manifested to us what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also I mean that is the idea that we spent years with this man we know everything that He wanted us to understand. The Spirit of God has given us the ability to recall it and share it with all great truth and doctrine. And that is, I mean, that's, that's the idea. And we have seen and heard what we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's a unique and beautiful concept that John's sharing with this, uh, with us. This idea of fellowship, uh, you know, many times within the Lord's Church, when we, when we talk about fellowship, that that is is a, we we use that to infer maybe we have a fellowship dinner, or when or when we have time before and after services, we get together socially and talk, and we have fellowship. The idea that John is giving here is far beyond that. Think about it from this perspective. When we are born, we are sinless and perfect, and we are, we are still one with the Father. At some point, sin enters our life, and when, and when sin enters our life, because of that, we then become separate from the Father. We no longer have an avenue with which we can fellowship with God. Only one thing can get us back into that relationship. And I, I would call this I would call this a bridge to be able to go over the chasm of where we are as sinful creatures back to God. And that bridge is the blood of Jesus. That bridge is the sacrifice that Jesus paid, the price that He paid to bring us back into a relationship with God. And it is only through His blood and our willingness to subject to follow what He has commanded us to do, our willingness to live a life of, of repentance, or a life of penitence, a life of, of continually walking in the light. And, and he's, going to, he's going to elaborate on that as He goes into this. That's what brings us back. Once that has happened, 
we are now in fellowship, not only with other Christians, not only with other Christians, but also with the Father. And to me, that's what that verse is saying, and Jesus. And in all actuality, we are in a relationship with the Father as a result of the blood of Jesus, which, which brings us into his, in, into, his, uh, into his family, the church. So listen to that again from that perspective. Verse 3, What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, other Christians. And indeed, our fellowship as a family of Christians, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father. Now, even though we have sinned and been separated from the Father, through the blood of Jesus, we are having fellowship with each other and with the Father and with the Son through the blood of Jesus. To me, that's one of the most incredibly beautiful pieces of Scripture that, that we find as far as helping us understand our relationship back with, with God. Uh, wow, just amazingly deep and, and the conceptual idea of, of us being brought back into the presence of the Father is, is, is a beautiful thought. And this, again, why this is important is these are the places that we get that. Uh, and we, many of us understand that and many of us assume that based on teachings that we've heard. But these are the scriptures that give us that. It's so important to us. And then he continues on, verse 4. These things we write so that our joy may be, may be made complete. The joy that he's talking about is the fellowship. So it is the, is the relationship that we have together as Christians with the Father. And again, it, it helps us appreciate the fact that each Sunday, one of the reasons that we, that we get up and, and we preach and we teach is so that we can understand appropriately these things. And it doesn't just become... A social event. It's not just something that we do. We do socially. It's something that we do so that we can understand fully what we are trying and needing to accomplish in our relationship now with the Father. Because now we are back into His presence, and we are back into a relationship with with the Father because of the fellowship that we get with other Christians in the church as a result of Jesus' blood, which brought us back into fellowship with God. Uh, to, to me, it's just it's just a it's a beautiful circle. Uh, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Now let's read one more verse, uh, verse 5, and then we'll, we'll hold verses 6 through 10 for next time because those, those kind of go together with a with deliberate thought. But really verse 5 is important because this is where he's really going to introduce the idea of what he's going to be teaching about for really the, the next couple of chapters uh, as we work through this. This is the message we have heard from him. So basically John has said, we were there. We, we, we talked to him, we heard him, we, we saw him, we, 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 we actually touched his fingers when he showed us where they were pierced by the, by the, uh, the, the nails on the cross. We were with him. He gave us a message. And now I'm going to tell you the message. I, I, in my mind, that's how I think about this. This is the message we heard from him and announced to you. I mean, the people that were there, the eyewitnesses, this is what Jesus told us to tell you, and we're, and we're going to tell you that. We're going to share that with you. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light. Uh, continuing on with that, finishing up that, that particular verse, and in Him there is no darkness at all. Uh, I had a... Uh, I wrote down some, some, uh, some areas of, of light which, which I hope... Uh, Oh, let me see if I can find that light and darkness, uh, light and evil, uh, ideas that, that help us differentiate God from Satan, God from evil, the, the, the things that are eternal from his perspective and what the world sees. There's a differentiation. There's a difference. And it is, it is shared with us in the idea of light, light being warm, it being revealing, it being embracing. You know, the first thing we do when we get up uh, in the mornings is we go and we turn on the light. The reason we do that is because it illuminates everything for us. That's what God does. That's what God, He, he, he shares with us a path back to Him since we have been separated from Him. He shares with us a, a, a way that we are reconciled 
to Him. Uh, such such beautiful concepts, and and the the idea that that God being light is something that John is going to now to kind of capitalize on over these next two chapters, and and really begin to to give some insight about that. Uh, we, we have we have heard this from from other from other writers in the New Testament, but John's going to give us perhaps the the most vivid description of of God as light. Uh, and again, this is kind of where he introduces in chapter one, verse five. This is a message that we have heard that we heard from Him to announce to you that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. Uh, it, it is a, it is a very to me. It's a very peaceful verse. It's a very it's a verse that 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 shares with us that God is not something that that we should see as vengeful. God is not something that we should feel as as punishment. God is something that that, that we embrace. God is something that we want to adhere to what He has asked us to do, uh, because what He is going to give us is is light, and that light is is eternal, and that light is is with the Savior. And with him, and those are those are things which should give us a lot of a lot of comfort and peace. I'm gonna stop there. We'll pick up in, in verse six uh, next week uh, and work through the rest of that, start into chapter two also, of course. Uh, but I appreciate you being along on this journey through First John. Uh, again, uh, for those of you who have been along for this journey, uh, the last uh, few months we've been in First Corinthians. And the the starkness in writing concepts is, is it, it again just it's just it's it's just very vivid as I as I try to think, and and it's not that one's better or worse. They're just they're just different. Uh, John again uses the most elementary language to teach some of the most in depth concepts uh, about the Father, and it's it's very it's a very enjoyable study that we're going to have through First John. Let's close with a prayer. Father, we're thankful for the wonderful genius of John. And we understand that that was also supplemented by the inspiration of your Spirit. And between those two, we have been given a masterful piece of piece of, uh, of literature here that we can understand our God, we can understand our Savior, we can understand how we should live. All things that help mature us as Christians in this, in this path that we have through our lives. As we fail you, forgive us. We ask that you Always love us as you've promised, and may in some small way we be worthy. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.